Uh, there is no middle ground. You understand that? There is no middle ground. Now, we live in a culture that is filled with compromise, where it's said that everyone has their own truth. Uh, there's nothing that is absolute. Uh, but the truth is, that's all a lie. Amen. There is absolute truth. That you can be wrong. Even though your therapist tells you you can. You can be wrong. You are either for God or you're against God. No in between. You are either on the angel's side or on the demon's side. No in between. You are either in your way on the way to heaven or on the way to hell. Which one is it? Twenty nineteen, our local news channel WBIR, they uh, reported a, a rather interesting report, still up on their website. It's entitled an article by Robin Wilhoit. One went to heaven, the other to hell, and uh, it's a catchy title, isn't it? Uh, but the article reported on near death experiences, and uh, it was a rather interesting article. It actually pointed out two people this has happened to in East Tennessee. One was a lady named. Priscilla McGill, and the other was a man named, of all names, Ronald Reagan is his name. Um, but the article uh, said this, it says, One night in March 2017, uh, this lady, McGill, walked to the Woodland Market on Woodland to buy cigarettes and a soda. She finished her errand, visited with some folks, and decided about 9.45 p.m. that it was time to head back home. As she crossed Woodland, uh, she dropped her cigarettes in the road. She bent down, grabbed them, and that's about the last thing she recalls after being hit by a vehicle. She was taken to UT Medical Center, and she lost consciousness when her heart stopped beating seven times. And in those seven times... She says she recalled these vivid experiences uh, where she uh, saw things. She saw uh, people she knew, including her own mother. Uh, she saw fields, bright flowers, lavish settings. And there was a woman there, she said, that told her to go back to the land of the living. Uh, today, she believes... Uh, after coming out of that experience, it's her duty to testify to God and bring people closer to God. Uh, this is a quote from her. She says, I feel like that I need to tell people, you know, is your heart right? Which uh, seems to think that your heart needs to be right to be in that place, right? Now, Mr. Reagan, he had a very different experience. As a young man... Growing up in East Tennessee, he had lived a very rough life, uh, one that included crime and violence, uh, fueled by drugs and alcohol. And at age 25, he found himself in a fight outside of an old liquor store. This is what he said. He said, I had hit him, and I knocked this man down. And that man broke a bottle and started stabbing me with the bottle repeatedly over and over again. And he said, in just minutes, I was bleeding to death. Uh, this uh, was just the beginning of Mr. Reagan's nightmare, though. In the ambulance, he said, he could feel his body floating above the gurney, yet he knew intellectually that his body was still on the gurney. He says, it was like I was passing through the open mouth of an active volcano or a burning lake. He says he saw the faces of people that he knew, people who were dead. And those people were telling him, Ronnie, don't come here. Ronnie, don't come here. There is no escape from where we are. He's also, uh, his body jerked around like he had been electrocuted, he said, as he was going in to this place. Now, I don't know about you, but that sure sounds a lot like how Jesus described hell, doesn't it? Amen. Doesn't it? After he recovered, praise God, Mr. Reagan repented, dedicated his life to helping save others, and he's been sharing his story ever since. And today he's a pastor at a local church. Uh, one doctor, Dr. Jeff Johnson at UT Medical Center, 
He said this describing these many experiences he had heard down through the years at the hospital. He said, I think maybe in the next few years or decades, we may have deeper answers into these experiences, particularly where the brain is concerned. But personally, I don't have a problem with it faith-wise. I think if it were truly only scientifically based, that I might have a problem with it. But I believe that there's another world, a spiritual world that we are all a part of. God's ways are not our ways. And I personally am content with that. Can I tell you something? There is another world. Amen. There is another world different than this uh, flesh and bone place that we are at, this place where we are now, a world that the Bible clearly explains as being just as real and probably more real than the existence that you know right now because this existence is passing away. It's going to be gone someday, right? And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth is what the scriptures tell us. This spiritual world, it has a history and, uh, and uh, it's more than we can possibly understand right now, but we're going to try to understand a little bit of it here in Revelation chapter 12 here today. Because it's going to describe an event in Revelation 12 in heaven that will happen in our future. How does all that line up, Pastor Scott? I don't know. I don't understand it all, but I understand enough to know I don't want to go where Mr. Reagan went. I understand enough of that, don't you? Praise God, we understand that. Which side are you on? Are you living as a citizen of heaven right now? Or are you living as a citizen of hell? When the veil is open, in case you didn't realize it, it will be clear to everyone whose side you were on including yourself. It says here, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here we see the two sides. Two sides here in heaven. Two sides of, uh, of the spiritual realm. Uh, Michael and his angels. Now Michael is an archangel, is what the Bible tells us. He's like a leader of the other angels. And he's particularly known as watching over God's people uh, and is associated with Israel. And the angels, in case you don't know it, they're not, little, they're not women with wings. They're not little babies with wings. The angels are scary, awesome, spiritual beings. And these angels are beings who God created to serve Him at His throne. And now then it speaks here of the dragon. The dragon and His angels. So, so Michael and this group have their group of angels. And the dragon and this group have their group of angels. And it seems they're in a fight at this point of time uh, 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 as we're looking ahead in the future. The demons are the angels who do not serve God. They serve the dragon, don't they? Some of y'all know these things, but I want to make it simple today. God created all the angels, but He gave them a free will. Do you know who else He created with a free will? You. You. You all have a free will. You, you made the choice to come down here and come to this church this morning. Uh, some of y'all have made the choice to follow Jesus Christ in eternal life and be saved, right? We all have a free will to make that choice. And these angels, it would seem, were given that will as well. Now, a third of them here chose to follow this other angel who believes himself to be better than God at being God. You ever felt that way? You ever think that you'd know better than God does about how things ought to be? You ever had that run through your mind? That boy, I tell you what, I wish God would get a little bit more perfect and get more of a perfectionist like I am, right? Yeah. That we all have, have a little arrogance about us, I'm sure, whether we want to admit it or not. Yeah. Because we were all following along with that old dragon himself a long time ago, right? Until he called us out into his marvelous light. Until we were saved by his awesome grace. 
this dragon. Now this dragon, as you can see, he's had many names over the centuries. All of them, many of them are listed here. There are other names as well. But these names describe his character, who he is. And you know what? It describes the character of those who are following him as well. So let's take a look here at what names are given to this dragon. First of all, he's called that old serpent. Boy, there's a lot in that word. That old serpent. That serpent has grown from back in the book of Genesis when he was sliding around through the Garden of Eden. He's grown into a dragon here at the end in Revelation, hasn't he? He's much bigger than that old serpent uh, that from so long ago. See, he was there in the Garden of Eden with our natural father and mother of all mankind, Adam and Eve. He tempted them into sin, though, uh, Adam and Eve, when God uh, had created them in innocence. And he did that for a reason. You know, why would, why would the devil want to trick, oh, Adam and Eve, our first parents are in the beginning, into sin? Because they were innocent, right? The devil was the one who was the dirty one. Why would he do that? Well, I've come to the conclusion he couldn't hurt God. So he was very clever. He said in his own mind, he believed he could draw God out by hurting those he loved. Now how was he going to draw God out by causing these to go into sin? Well, he believed that if he did this, God might come out and he might be able to destroy him and take his place. And that's exactly what happened. God came to earth frail in the frame of a man named Jesus, didn't he? Amen. The Godhead bodily, right? In a human front. He, he put himself out there where he was in danger, it would seem, right? When he come in the frail humanity of mankind. And uh, the devil there, he thought that he w would bring him out. He even, it's almost a mockery of the great love God had in coming down from earth to man. When he finally comes down to earth to man and he begins telling them the gospel and the good news of who he is and, and what, what can happen if they'll follow him, what do they do? They drag him down the streets. These people he loved, that he cared for, who were actually following the dragon and didn't know it. They drag him out and they, they brutally beat him. They hang him upon an old cross and the devil is like, I've won, right? I've finally beaten that, that God. He's gone. He's gone. And then three days later, what happened? Christ arose, didn't he? Amen. Christ arose. God used for His glory the cross. What did, what did Jesus do for us there? It tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made Him to be sin for us. Jesus paid the price for our sins on the cross. We say it so many times in church, we get so used to saying it, but the truth is that's the greatest news that ever was told, Right? What an awesome thing that is. He made Him to be sin for us who knew, no, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. There was a purpose in it, wasn't there? There was a reason why He was hung upon that cross, why He rose from that grave. So when you hear that old world, that, that serpent word there, you need to think hate. Because that's what the devil does. He hates. You know what the God of our creation does he loves he loves so ask yourself this morning do i have hate in my heart do i have hate in my heart or do i have love that might tell you which side you don't mind it another name here that's given in this passage is the devil the diablos you heard that name of some places i wouldn't want to go to that the word devil means the accuser did you know that accusing the brethren is Satan's primary ministry right now. He sits before the throne of God and he does that. He accuses us. You know what probably wondering, why is he in heaven, right? Why is there a war in heaven? Why is the devil in heaven? I thought he's supposed to be in hell. No, he ain't in hell to the very end, okay? That, that's when he's cast down to hell. Right now he's roaming to and fro like a lion seeking whom he may devour, is what Peter tells us. <laughs> if you don't see him out here today, I don't, you must be blind, okay? Because he's out there. But he stands there and he accuses people. He accuses him. You know what you caught in so and so? They were down here doing this last night. You need to do something about them, God. You need to take them out. And every time when it's one of us who are saved, he's accusing. He looks over at Jesus and what does Jesus say? 
Or don't you remember? I hung upon that cross for that one. That don't make him get any better from what he's doing. But he's on a journey and I'm going to get him to where he needs to be or her needs to be. I'm going to get them to where they need to be. And he shuts the mouth of the old accuser, right? Diablos also sometimes uses church members to accomplish his goal of uh, accusing the brethren. Amen. Now listen real carefully. Every bit of slander against another brother or sister in Christ is simply the devil using an individual's mind and vocal cords. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? As I said, the devil means the accuser, the slanderer, right? Listen to this term in Titus 2, 3, where it speaks uh, of the ladies in the church and how the older ladies should be. It says there in Titus 2, 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. They, they live holy lives, not false accusers. <laughs> Literally rendered, uh, that accuser is Diablos, right? Satan. So basically it's saying, don't let the aged women be not she-devils. <laughs> don't let the aged women be she-devils accusing one another. A woman who gossips is a she-devil. You know what a man who gossips is? A macho devil, I guess. But they both the devil, right? The devil's in them when you're out here gossiping and you're tearing down one another and you're accusing the brethren. That's what you're doing. Both are controlled by the power of Diablos, the devil, when they gossip and slander. Now, I want to ask you something. I want to ask you something. Is gossip and slander in your heart? That might tell you whose side you own, might it? That might tell you whose side. Remember, there ain't no neutral ground here. Whose side are you on? Goes on. He gives another name here of that old devil. He's the Satan, right? The Satan, the Satanus, the, the adversary. The adversary. He's an enemy. He's the ultimate enemy to God's people, but will come across as the best friend you ever had. I heard a story recently about a, a, a woman, a wicked woman. Uh, it was about 1900s, I think, or the 1800s, they said. She stood outside of this costume party around Halloween. And while she was outside the costume party, she had on this mask, and the lady inside the house thought, well, that's one of our friends who's come dressed up. And she invited this woman in. Well, she did not know that this woman was actually someone who was a child murderer. She went back into the back room, grabbed her child, and went on out the door. And, and they've never seen that child since, according to this story uh, that I heard. How many times do you invite the enemy in your house, mistaking him as a friend? Mistaking him as a friend and not as a threat? I think sometimes he comes in and he sits in our houses and our churches and actually the enemy of God and his people too sit there perhaps not even realizing that they're the enemy themselves. There's a song I heard at the church where I used to pastor at. They'd sing it. It says, if you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God. You ever heard that song? Amen. Hmm? Yeah, it's a biblical song. If you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God. I think in the song it even quotes the chapter and verse where it's at. But if you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God, do you? Amen. One has to ask oneself, if we aren't loving those around us, are we really loving God? It really puts things in perspective because you can make up a God in your mind that likes everything you do and does everything you want, right? And he's the devil, okay? Okay. Because the true God doesn't like everything you do and go along with everything you want. He's getting you in the right way, in the way of righteousness, that He might present you to His Son as a beautiful, glorious bride, right? That's what He's doing. Maybe we ought to be careful of which one we're letting in, which one we're following. And maybe we ought to be careful that we're loving our neighbors, right? Because that might tell you whose side you're on, right? Not only that, it says here, he's a deceiver. Can I plank that in plain English for you this morning? He's a liar. Amen. He's a liar. John tells us that Satan deceives the whole world, right? How? The devil raises up false religious systems and tells people to pick one, anyone, right? Right now they're out here in all sorts of different false religious systems. And you know what? Those who follow in those false religious systems, if they continue in those false religious systems, they're going to hell. 
All these different ones. That's not a popular thing to say, right? He lies by telling people, Christians who are halfway in, you're fine the way you are. Just come to church every now and then. When people mention God, just nod your head and go on. Don't actually get serious about following God. Don't actually get serious about, about this Christian life that you're living. Satan also deceives people through false doctrine, right? False teaching. He spreads his lies throughout the world to make people useless regarding the truth. As a matter of fact, we are probably in the most biblically illiterate generation in the history of this United States, okay? Amen, amen. Yeah. If we put down our phones and pick up our Bibles a little more and read them, I think we'd be a whole lot different people, don't you? A lot of false teaching, a lot of false things out here. He blinds the minds of unbelievers too so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. Are you a false teacher? You say, I don't even teach anything, Scott. I just come to church. I don't teach nobody anything. Well, well, folks, think about this for a minute. Everybody teaches something with their life, don't they? Everybody does. And if you say you're a Christian and yet you act like the devil, what are you teaching people? You're teaching them a false doctrine, aren't you? And that's exactly what Jesus told the old Pharisees who stood up and they claimed themselves to be godly people. He said, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Is speaking a lie as easy as breathing for you? Well, you might be a child of the devil, right? You might be. So this battle that we're looking at chronologically is occurring uh, in the tribulation after the rapture. The midpoint, many believe, is, is when this battle, this war takes place. But one could say right now it's being fought too. And outside of heaven, we're in a war as well. Everyone hearing my voice is on one side or the other, right? The lying, the deceiving, accusing enemy of God's people versus the truthful, light-showing, encouraging people of God. Which one are you in this morning? When death takes place, the veil will be lifted. Did you trust Jesus? Did you really trust Jesus? And if so, my friend, you'll be changed, right? Amen. You'll be different. You'll be different. Not just a false fakery over top of you. You'll be different from inside and all the way out, right? Different than the rest of this world. Isn't that what happened with Pastor Reagan there? Before he was one way. Now he's another, right? A change. A change. One side or the other. Jesus said this Himself. He said, He that is not with me is what, church? Against me. That's pretty plain English, isn't it? If you're not with Christ, you're against Him. Who are you with here this morning? Look here at Revelation 12, verse 10. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accusion of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. What does this tell us, church? The devil's folks go down, but God's people rise up, don't they? Former uh, First Lady Michelle Obama when faced with political cruelty, she said this, when they go low, we go high. Now, I, I'll leave it to you whether she puts that in practice or not. And I don't agree with everything the Obamas have said in the past, but I can get on board with that statement, okay? Amen. When they go low, it's kind of like what your mama might have used to say to you, don't stoop down to their level, right? You're different, aren't you? You're different than those people out in the world. God's people don't act like the devil's people, and God's people are going up while Satan's folks are going down. You want to know which side of the war you're on? Take a hard look at yourself here. Just listen to these three things. How did God's people handle being lied about, accused, and being deceived? How do they handle that? Well, it tells us right there in the Scriptures, doesn't it? First of all, they handle it by the blood of the Lamb. When Satan accuses us, we just got to point him back to that old cross, don't we? Oh, look at him. Well, you want to accuse me? You see that blood that was shed for me. You're right. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve any of the good things that God has given me. I don't deserve any of it. But he gave it to me and I took it. And praise God for Jesus Christ. We'll overcome him, church, by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. 
people accuse you, don't get sad. Get glad. Jesus said when people are tearing us down out here in this world, then the Lord is lifting us up, right? He said rejoice. Rejoice, for we have heaven, right? And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. They overcome him by the word of their testimony. Their testimony. And that simply means their witness, the word of their witness. When the devil and his folks lie about us here, you just say, well, just look at my life. Look at what Jesus has done for me. Just look at it. People will lie about you if you follow Jesus. Can I tell you that? Amen or oh me, yeah? They're going to lie about you. And, but Jesus told us this, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And finally it says here, they love not their own lives. This is how we reveal we are not deceived by Satan's lies. We don't live like the rest of the world. If you truly believe this Bible, you're going to be willing to suffer for what you believe about it, right? A lot of people ain't willing to suffer for it. If you truly believe you're saved and will enter heaven when you die, you'll spend your life on what's important, won't you? You won't spend your life on things that's going away in this old world, right? Jesus told a parable about a man who found a pearl in a piece of land. And he went and he sold all he had to buy that land and gain that pearl. It's called the pearl of great price. And Jesus said this parable was about the kingdom of heaven. And while we cannot pay for salvation to earn it in any way, it, once we've found the prize, we'll be willing to give up anything to receive it. Anything to receive what God has for us. Would you give up anything? Would you give up your own life for Jesus Christ? I've often thought about that. Would I be willing to give up my own life? Well, folks, I tell you what, if you've received Him, you have given up your own life. Because it's His, isn't it? But the devil knows today is not long before the rapture is going to take place, right? He's got a short time, doesn't he? God's people are going to be called out of this old earth and hell is going to begin upon this old earth. I want to ask you this morning, are you ready? Whose side are you on? You don't have to go through a near-death experience to see where you're heading. Matter of fact, I wouldn't trust a near-death experience. Can I tell you that? The devil can lie to you in a lot of ways, can he? I wouldn't even trust that. You know what I'm going to trust is what God's Word tells me. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. 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 Confession that Jesus is Lord, well, that's your justification. That's a one-time experience. If you were saved, that occurred at that one time. But believing in your heart and His resurrection reflects your sanctification. It's, that's growing as a Christian throughout the rest of your life. In other words, believe it is true and then live like it's true. Thou shalt be saved. It's all very simple. It's all very simple, isn't it? Say, I, I guess I should have started here the minute where I was at. It's all very simple. Don't let the dragon confuse it here this morning. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you at Omega Baptist Church.